Well, howdy, everybody. Uh-oh, low network speed. Oh, there we go. Connection now available. Let's see how that works. Well, howdy, everyone. It's Al with Longoria House Dog Training. It's Wednesday night, yet another of our live Q&As. I'm so excited. I've got, geez, I've got tons and tons of stuff uh, to talk about today. So I uh, hope you guys have, are having a good week. If you're not having a good week, hey, what can I do to be able to help you with your dogs? Or hey, do you need any kind of advice or anything like that? If you're watching this after the fact, hey, thanks so much for watching, um, but really appreciate all of you guys. Um, if you don't know who I am, if you're just seeing my face and see who this strange guy is, uh, my name is Al Longoria. I am a dog trainer. Um, I live in Houston, Texas. Um, I've been a professional dog trainer. Mm, I think I've been a, a professional dog trainer for about eight years now. Um, I've been training dogs for over 13 years. Um, we've done a lot of different things. Some of the cool things that I get to do is I work, uh, I train for a sport called IPO, which is about to change its name again. Uh, this is a sport designed for German Shepherd dogs. Um, really a very cool sport because we get to teach the dogs, uh, you know, how to do protection work. We also get to teach them some advanced obedience. Uh, we also get to do tracking, which is scent detection but it's a lot of fun. Um, as, a do as a dog trainer, professional dog trainer, the main thing that I do is I coach a ton of people. Um, we coach people anywhere from how to get their dogs potty trained. We also coach people on how to get their dogs to walk nicely on a leash, how to come when called, how to go to Starbucks and drink a cup of coffee, you know, and stay calm when they're in public. So you name it, we're, prob we're probably doing it. So if there's anything that you need help with, be sure to ask us a question and do that. Hey, for all you guys tuning in, Rob, hey, thanks for saying hi. Mel, hope you're doing well tonight. Mandy, I see that you're on there. Mom, love you, thanks for tuning in. Uh, appreciate all you guys and all you guys that are watching after, um, after this has been filmed, hey, welcome. Um, but really what I wanna do with this Q&A tonight is I just wanna bring a lot of value to you. Like we like doing these because I know sometimes that there's some things that you may not know uh, about about your dog or how to actually deal with the situation. So what I've done is I've got a pretty long list of questions that people have been asking, and I just want to make sure that you get the full context. So as you're hearing as you're hearing me talk, if you have questions, hey, feel free at any point to chime in. If you're watching this after the fact, go ahead and drop your question down, and then I'll make sure that it gets onto my next live show. Doing that. Hey, Steve, thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for joining in tonight. Uh, it's going to be a good video. But hey, Steve, what I'd also mention is scroll through my Facebook page, go through Instagram, go through YouTube. We have tons and tons of video. We've got even more coming. If there's, if you're looking for a specific thing and you can't find it, then that's the place to go ahead to go ahead and ask that. So hey, appreciate I appreciate every single last one of you guys that spends any time here. Um, if I can ask you to do anything, you'll see uh, two things. One, you're going to see that share button down in the corner. That means a lot to me when you share my content, okay? Because that's the lifeblood of how we actually get to, you know, my business operates based on word of mouth. When you hit share, that's like you telling your friends that, hey, this might be something that's useful or interesting. And then it's my job uh, to really provide some value for them. But the other thing that you can do is that every once in a while, you're going to see that Facebook is going to send a notification that, hey, you know, would you like to be alerted anytime that he goes live? I generally only go live once a week, so you're not going to see me blowing up your phone all the time that I'm live, but go ahead and hit that, and then you'll get the notification that, hey, his live show is on, and then you can come and you can ask your question. So I do appreciate all you guys that are joining in. It, it just really means the world to me. I'm humbled by the fact that you're even that you're even here so if i can do anything to provide value so i'm just going to check a couple of things because i want to make sure that on the technical side um that everything that i'm talking about is actually being seen and i'm not missing any of y'all's questions okay all right great so i can see everything on my screen over here i'm just going to type the word hello real quick into the screen to make sure See what's coming out. All right, so it's coming out as me personally. All right, guys, so the very first question that I'd like to cover tonight is I do want to go over this question. How do I get my dog to stop shedding? So again, the question is, 
How do I get my dog to stop shedding? So there's a lot that goes to this, okay? But the very core of it is, look, depending on what kind of dog you have, your dog is going to shed. There's no real way to actually stop a dog from shedding. Now, there are some breeds that are, you know, no shedding or very, very ultra light shedding breeds, okay? But in general, if you want to stop shedding totally, okay, there's not, a, there's not an easy way to do it. So what are some of the things that I recommend that you can do to begin to help your dog maybe shed less? So here's tip number one to get your dog to actually shed less. One, don't shampoo your dog too often. I've ran into some people that are actually shampooing their dog maybe once a week or every few days because the dog is stinky or whatever it is. That's actually going to irritate your dog's coat quite a bit. So I never recommend really, uh, you know, showering your dog or bathing your dog with shampoo all that often. Now for my German Shepherds, I'll be quite honest, I only really shampoo them maybe uh, maybe every four to six months, okay? I do water rinse my dogs quite a bit to kind of wipe off all the dirt and the debris that's gonna get into their coat, but the number one thing to, to not get your dog to shed too much is to not over bathe the dog with shampoo, okay? Now, beyond that, here are some other practical things. The big one that influences your dog's shedding is going to be the dog's nutrition. So if you don't already know, I want to show you two brands of food that we feed. Uh, this food right here is called Acana, and I really use Acana. Uh, it's a really, really wonderful whole food that you can use for your dog. Just to kind of give you an idea of what's in there, the ingredients read like a fine dining restaurant. It says deboned beef, deboned pork, beef meal, whole green peas, red lentils. Here, I'll move down the list. Uh, butternut squash, kale, spinach. There's virtually no chemical names anywhere in this bag of dog food. Now, if you're going to use your dog's food to eliminate shedding, it's probably going to take about four weeks of being on a high quality food before you're going to see a significant difference, okay? So here's one food, and we do feed this to our dogs regularly. What's another one? Okay, this one right here, it's made by the same company. You'll notice that the labels are very similar. This one is called Origin, O-R-I-J-E-N. This is a puppy food. This one is also very, very good to, if, as, a, as a nutritional thing for your dog, that it will really help reduce the amount of shedding. Now, beyond that, I want to get just a little specific, okay? There are nutrients, okay, that specifically help your dog to shed less. So the one specific nutrient that's gonna help your dog shed a lot less is an omega-3 fatty acid called DHA. And you can find DHA in sardines and anchovies and salmon. So what I'd like to recommend to you guys is this bottle right here that we use for our dogs that I supplement, not all the time, but from time to time. And so this is Iceland Pure uh, Pharmaceutical Grade Sardine and Anchovy Oil. Um, the reason that I like this one, there's several reasons. One is that it doesn't stink. Like when you put the fish oil into the dog's food, it doesn't smell extremely fishy. So this is another one. The other two is I'm real picky about plastics and fat. And so I will use this one because it has an aluminum uh, that's not gonna let the metal leach into the oil. And so that's a really good idea if you're, uh, if you're really particular uh, the way that I am. So, so far, don't bathe your dogs too much. The second thing that you can do is make sure that you're feeding them a high quality diet like this Acana or the Origin. And then the third thing that you can do is, you know, using this Iceland Pure, a really high grade, uh, really high grade sardine and anchovy oil. So I've got one more tip beyond that, okay? So the tools that I use to groom my dog have a lot to do with it. So you're gonna see things like the Furminator, and I have used the Furminator, I actually have one, but I actually no longer use it. The two tools that I use to groom my dog and to really kind of keep their, their coats looking good and get all the shedding out is this one. This is called a rake. And then this one, obviously, just a regular brush like that. So you can see those fine bristles there. And this one, just a little bit more of a comb. This one's really used more for the undercoat. And this one right here is used to basically get out, uh, to brush out the, the top. 
so those are my tips, okay? So tip number one was don't overbathe your dog. Tip number two, feed a very high grade uh, dog food. Tip number three is if you want to even get a, an extra benefit, feed uh, higher amounts of omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, and you can find it in sardines and anchovy oil. And then the last thing that I recommend for shedding, uh, for shedding dogs is using a brush and using a rake. And I think that those things are gonna really help you out a lot. Hey, thank you to everybody that's joining in tonight. If you haven't already said hello, make sure you say hi. If you have a question, I would love to take any of the questions uh, that you have, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next point. So number one was how do I get my dog to stop shedding, okay? Number two is how do I get my dog to potty outside? It's been my experience that, you know, we tend to really push the dogs quite a bit when we're wanting them to go outside. Hey, Karen, how are you doing? It's good, it's good to see you. So when you're wanting your dog to potty outside, it really is about leadership, okay? Especially if you have a really young dog. What I recommend to you is that I want you to grab your leash. I want you to be very specific where you take the dog in the backyard. And once you actually have your dog in the backyard where you want it, I want you to become very patient. Here's one little practical tip that I do. When I take dogs out, um, I'll put a timer on my phone or on my watch, and I'll say, hey, you know, set a timer for three to five minutes. And in those three minutes, three to five minutes, if my dog actually goes and uses the restroom in the spot that I want it to go, then this is the most important step. I'm gonna make a very big memory for the dog that this is what I want. How can you make memories for the dog? Well, you can play. You can also feed your dog some food. You can also pet your dog and you can praise your dog. But you know what I like to do with this is I actually like to be feeding them something very tasty as I'm petting them and as I'm talking and all those three things going on from anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds to show them how happy I am that they use the restroom where I want them to do. And the big thing that's gonna teach your dog to continue to use the restroom outside without you asking is you setting up a habit and going out there with them to begin with. I'm pretty convinced that if you were to go out there 14 days in a row and each time your dog needed to use the restroom and you did the technique that I described, I believe that 95% of the dogs out there that are having problems that that's gonna clear it up. So the things that you don't wanna do is just put the dog out there by itself and really, you know, maybe not give the dog any direction. Other things that you can do that affect your dog's ability to potty outside is leaving free food and free water out. I know that can be kind of a hot topic for people sometimes, but I don't like leaving those things out with dogs that don't know where to go. So I control them so I can help them time it. All right. Hey, everybody that's joined in, thanks so much for uh, spending some of your Wednesday night with me. If you can do anything for me other than ask the questions, because I really, really love your questions, the big thing that you can do is if you see that share button that's down there, go ahead and click that share button. Maybe even tag a friend, but it means the world to me uh, whenever you guys share my content. That's really the lifeblood of what we do here at Longoria House. We so depend on each and every one of you guys to share uh, to share our content and that word of mouth. So it's so important to me. And if you do that, it just means so much. So I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. All right, so this is a pretty good question that I have next. So the next question I have is about this uh, controversial tool right here, um, which is a prong collar. Now for any of you guys that have ever trained with us, um, yes, we do use these. We don't use this in every circumstance, but we do use them because some dogs can actually benefit from the information that this gives. Now, I do plan on the near future doing a full-blown episode, um, really more of a how-to explaining prong collars, what they actually do, how to effectively use them, and how it can really help build a better relationship with your dog. But there are some pitfalls to this tool that you need to be aware of. But the specific question that I had is how do I properly put together a prong collar? So again, how do I properly put it together? So the one big no-no when it comes to prong collars is you should never take your prong collar and put it on over the top of your dog's head. 
You never ever wanna do that with a prong collar because it, one, it's not gonna be effective, and two, it could actually be dangerous to your dog to have the prong collar if you can slip it on over the top of their head. Now, with this prong collar, it's not so easy to put on, and that's one of the, the, the things that I don't like about the prong collar, but let me just show you how to take this apart and put it together. So when you take this, I put two fingers here and two fingers there, Okay, and now you see my thumb back there and I'm pressing and it's sliding back and forth. I'm gonna slide it and pull it out and it's gonna snap out. And then to put it back together, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the tip of one of these in and then I'm gonna slide the other one there. See, so I missed. You wanna make sure that you get the tip of one, squeeze and then slide the other one in to where both metal, both of those are together. That's the proper way to put a prong collar together. Now, the other thing I want to show you, this particular brand is called a Herm Springer. It comes with this little plate that you can see right here. Here, we'll flip it this way. The lights are really uh, blurring that out. But there, you can see that. When you have prongs on this, you want to make sure that there is an equal number of prongs on either side of the collar, okay, because that's going to make sure that it works well. One last tip. Whenever you attach a leash to a prong collar, Okay, and you're using it to teach the dog to not pull on the leash, you wanna attach the leash to this, this is called the D-ring, as opposed to attaching the leash to your O-ring, okay? There's a lot of different ways to use this. You can also use it attached to both rings, but that won't be effective for those dogs that are really heavy pullers. All right, hope that was helpful for you guys. Thanks so much for joining in tonight, and I'm gonna move on to the next question. So the next question is, how do I teach my dog to come when called? So I, when I'm training with clients and I'm actually, they're going through our five or six week program that's gonna cover leash walking, that's gonna cover coming when called, that's gonna cover stays. I actually begin the process of teaching the dog how to come when called when they're doing their stays. So let me just make it very, very simple, a technique that you can do if you have a brand new puppy and you're beginning to show the dog the meaning of its name. So tip number one, I actually want you to not use the dog's name unless you're doing what I'm about to say next. So when you first get a puppy and you want to say their name, I think that you should bring food to their mouth and at the moment that you open their hand, your hand and the puppy begins to gobble up the food, that's the moment that I want you to say the dog's name for at least a week. Okay, now people are like, well, how do I get the dog's attention? Well, I want you to actually call your puppy something else. One of the things that we do that's really worked for me is we actually call our dogs like puppy girl or buddy or something like that. If I want to talk, if I want to use a name that isn't going to be like a critical thing that I need you to turn around and come back. So one, use this kind of common name, puppy girl, chunky monkey, buddy, something like that. Okay, that's not critical. But then for a week or two, the only time that you actually say the name of your dog when you want to teach it to come when called is at the moment that you're opening your hand and they're beginning to consume food. So that's step one. I do have plenty of videos here on my Facebook page if you're wondering how to teach your dog how to come when called that can actually work you through the treat toss game. And the treat toss game is a really wonderful foundational game that can begin to make the association to your dog that when I hear, my, when I hear them my name, I should perform a 180 degree turn. Okay, well hope that's helpful for you guys. Hey, thanks so much for joining in. Oh, I see my brother joined in. Hey brother, good to see you. Hope you had a good day, man. All right, so, so far we've covered how do I get my dog to stop shedding. I've also covered how do I get my dog to potty outside. We've gone over how do I properly put together a prong collar. And then the next one was how do I teach my dog to come when called? And I gave you my number one tip uh, for associating your puppy's name. Hey, brother. All right, so what's next? How do I teach my dog not to jump? This is one of the most common ones that the one, most common ones that I get. So jumping really is a problem, but let me just kind of describe a couple of things for you about jumping. So if you think about two and three week old pup puppies and four week old puppies, the main thing that those guys are doing when they're you know with their litter mates is that they're playing. 
And jumping, believe it or not, is a form of play for the dog. This is actually how they greet each other and it's instinctive for the dog to do this. And so a lot of dogs, a lot of dogs continue to do that with their, uh, with their humans um, once they've come into the home. Let me give you some techniques that absolutely are, one, they might work, but they're really, really impractical. So this is, uh, this is technique number one that I would never use if your dog is jumping on you. So the number one thing that I would not do is if when your dog jumps on you, do not turn your back to your dog. Tip number two, okay, alongside with don't turn your back to the dog when they're jumping on you is don't step away from the dog. So the dog's on, if the dog is jumping on you, you turn your back and you take a step away, that's actually going to tell your dog to jump on you Again, that's right, if you turn away from your dog and move away, that's actually communicating to your dog, I would like for you to jump on me again. Now, if you've ever been in someone's personal space, I know that when I'm standing, if somebody's shoulder to shoulder with me, I don't really feel them in my personal space, maybe a little bit, but if somebody was to turn around and to be right in front of me and they were taller than me, then my tendency would be to back away. So if your dog jumps on you, the first thing that I actually want you to do is to actually step towards your dog, okay? And that's gonna kind of turn the table. You're, you gotta realize that when your dog is jumping on you, it is most likely a form of play. But you're gonna go on defense if you move away and that's gonna tell your dog to continue to offend your space. So if your dog jumps on you, first step into them, okay? Now, there are some other things, but I'm gonna get right to the point here. If your dog is continually jumping on you and you've done everything to try to communicate to them, it is okay to tell your dog no and then to use your training leash to put some pressure on your dog and ask them to back off. And it shouldn't necessarily be gentle, okay? But I want you to be patient with your dog as you're trying to show them that you don't want, you, that you don't want them jumping on you, okay? But the quick and easy way to, to change any kind of jumping is the dog jumps, and then creating some kind of emotion that tells the dog that this is unwanted. This is how you know other dogs will treat each other when they actually go over the boundaries of what they're supposed to do. The other dog will use pressure, okay, their teeth. We should use a leash to ask the dog, to tell the dog to back out of our personal space. But it should still be coupled with how you want the dog to greet you. If the dog shouldn't be jumping on you, you should use your training leash to ask your dog to sit okay, or to wait patiently on their place. And then when they do that, you should make it remarkable for them to understand that this is the best way to greet you. And you should practice that day in and day out until your dog totally understands that. All right, so let's move in to the next one. All right, so we had a kind of a, a technical question. Well, not a technical question, but a dog training question. So it was recently asked to me, do you make your, your clients sign a contract? So, you know, a lot of times a contract is going to be one of those things that's going to make us, you know, that's going to say, hey, these are my obligations and these are your obligations and what you're supposed to do. I just want to be blunt, okay, with everybody here. When I come to train your dogs, I want to make sure that that job gets 100% done before I'm gone. Nothing is more important to me than seeing you and your dogs having a harmonious relationship and that one, you know how to communicate clearly and the dog actually knows what to do. So to answer the question, do I make my client sign a contract? The answer is no, but I do hold my clients accountable for the, the homework that I ask them to do. So for example, if I gave you homework um, and I come back the next week and you said you didn't practice, well, then it's unfair to have the expectation that I would continue to come beyond the length of that course to make sure that you, your dog learned it if you're not putting in the work. But on the flip side, if you're putting in the work, if you're busting your tail and you're trying to work with your dog, then it's my responsibility to make sure that you guys are set up for success and that you know that you're gonna reach your goals. So that's really, I don't make people sign a contract, but I work with you to accomplish the goals that we set out uh, to achieve from the beginning. All right, so what's next? So what are the terms and conditions for my business? This goes right alongside, you know, with the contract, okay? The terms and conditions for my business are this, okay? 
We want to help you raise a happy and reliable dog. That's my number one goal, okay? That your dog would be very clear on what it is that you want it to do and that your dog actually is having a great life because it understands those things. So the terms or conditions, if you put in the work, I've got your back. That's it, it's that simple, okay? I'm gonna show up on time. I'm gonna make sure to have material that's, uh, that's relevant to you and your dog. I'm gonna continuously research my craft and make sure that it's something that's useful for you. And then we're gonna be very patient with you and your dog as you learn how to communicate in a way that's meaningful. And we'll continue to do things like this to really help you guys understand how to get the most out of your relationship. All right, guys, well, we're moving right along. Okay, hey, if anybody has any questions, it'd mean the world to me if somebody threw up a question on there that you have. Hey, are you getting anything out of this? If you are getting out of this, it means a lot to me to kind of just see these little hearts that kind of fly up over on the corner every once in a while. So, hey, but I do appreciate each and, each and every one of you guys that's joining in tonight. Uh, like I said, it really, means, it really means a lot to me that you spend some of your time here, but it also means a lot to me if you go over there and you hit that share button and uh, tell your friends about what we're doing here. So that means a lot to me. All right, so, oh man, this is a really great question. So how is body language important? You know, how is body language important when you're communicating to your dogs? You know, what most people don't realize is that dogs actually have forms of communication, okay? And I preach this all the time. So the four main things that I'm preaching about are the languages that your dog understands. Your dog understands pressure. Your dog understands scent. Your dog understands motion. And your dog finally understands sound. So let's make that a little bit more practical. Okay, so I said pressure, scent motion, sound. And that's the hierarchy for how your dog natively, instinctively understands things. So what does that represent? That represents your leash. That represents the smell of their food. That represents the way that you move your body. And that represents the sound of your voice. But I'll tell you this, when dogs communicate to each other, they do two things, okay? They're really gonna, one, when they're very close, that pressure is very, very important. Like how are they physically touching each other? What's of equal importance is how does the other dog smell? If you've ever seen two dogs greet each other or the way that dogs routinely greet humans is that they begin to sniff them. But the third way, and I think that dogs actually share this quite a bit, is through canine body language. You know, a lot of the bites that you see people take on television or even, you know, not on TV, are because a human misread canine body language. You know, one of the most misunderstood forms of canine body language is growling. A lot of people think that growling, that growling is the sign of a dog that is uh, vicious or dangerous. And I just gotta be honest with you, a dog that's growling is really a dog that is afraid and is asking for space. Um, and so you gotta be really careful with the growling, but hey, canine body language, Super, super important. I could probably spend the next two hours talking about it, but just know this, that canine body language is one of the single biggest things that we should learn to understand our canine companions better. Hey, Steve, I see that you've got a question. I'm gonna go ahead and get to that one next. Let me go ahead and pull it up over here. So why does our do dog take our personal items like our shoes to the front door while we are away at work? Is it because, okay, and I don't think I can see the rest of your question, but I'll go ahead and give you an answer, okay? So the answer is a very personal one to your dog, okay? Scent plays a big deal in the dog's world. I'll tell you something that actually happened a couple of days ago. If you're here in Houston, you know that it's been raining quite a bit. And, uh, and I think not this morning, but yesterday morning, I did not take uh, Gabby out to do the play that we normally do um, every morning. So I'm sitting in my living room, I'm working on some business stuff, and lo and behold, what do I see in my dog's mouth? I see one of my shoes. And it's really interesting to me because I've got quite a few shoes inside of my closet, but she actually picks up the one that has my strongest scent. And the reason that you're seeing that most likely is because one, your dog probably misses you, but more importantly, that's one of the dog's way of saying that, hey, 
I would really like to play a game with you. It's not, your dog is not trying to tell you that I need a toy. It's saying that, hey, I really love spending time together with you and how can we play? If your dog has one of your shoes, I would recommend to not discipline your dog, but really look at like, hey, am I really spending enough personal time playing an interactive game with my dog? Let me just make a recommendation, okay? One of the things and one of the toys that we recommend to dogs is I really love this toy right here. This is a, you know, this is a very simple ball and a string. Um, I do sell these, uh, but this is an everlasting fun ball. And it is, you know, it's on this rope because what I like to do is sometimes I'll load treats right here into this cavity for the puppies to play with. But what I also want to do is I also want to play a little bit of game of tug, also play some fetch with the dog. So when you see them, you know, grabbing your shoes and all that, it's just really saying that your dog misses you and wants to play. And if you ever see that, please don't discipline your dog, but please, you know, begin to put more time into your schedule to interact with them in a very meaningful way. And if you don't know some of the things that you can do, I'd love to teach you some of the games. There's two big games that I play with dogs. I love playing two ball where I throw one ball, they bring the, they bring the ball that I threw back and then I throw the second one and back and forth they go. My dogs love that game. But the other game that I like to play is I love to play tug with my dog. It brings a lot of fulfillment to them and it really is a good workout for me too when you're playing with you know 60 and 70 pound German Shepherds. So hey, hope that's helpful for you, Steve. Really appreciate the question. Uh, and uh, yes, we will be in contact with you soon. So hey, Patty, thanks for joining in tonight. Hope you're doing well. Hey, Dustin, thanks for joining in, man. Really, really appreciate you. Hey, Ann, I didn't see you. It's good, good to see you. Oh yeah, and there's that ball on the rope, okay? If any of you guys are interested in that toy, um, we do have a little bit of a sale going on right now. You can buy one ball for 15 bucks, um, but you can get two uh, for $25, and that's really a great deal. My dogs play with those toys every single morning, so if you're looking for a nice and durable, uh, durable toy, uh, that's a pretty good one. It's not a chew toy, so I wouldn't necessarily leave that together with my dog, but it is a toy that you can interact uh, together with them. All right, so let me go ahead and move on. Uh, let me go ahead and move on to the next one. So I have another question uh, that was asked on a dog training forum, and the question was, what are the first steps, uh, what are the first steps to being a dog trainer? All right, so I really thought about this one a lot today, and I I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my personal story about how I became a dog trainer, um, and then I'm gonna actually answer the question very directly. Um, so, I don't remember what the year, I guess it was 2010, maybe 2009, 2010, and I had just been laid off uh, from a job, um, and I had been at that job for several years, uh, but oil and gas here in Houston was really taking a hit, um, so I, I was laid off, and then um, it was six months of job searching, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find work. I, I was training some dogs kind of part-time uh, as I was able to pick up work. Um, at the time, I think I was charging um, $250 for eight weeks of training. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I was just really doing that. And then about six months came in, I couldn't get hired anywhere. Um, and I had a few clients and I just decided to go all in and, and to do this full time. Um, there was a lot of pressure because I didn't want to be homeless. I could I could lose my home if we didn't if I didn't make enough money. But I just started I just started hustling and I hustled and I hustled and I hustled and you know what? I'm still hustling today. So, you know, what are the first steps to becoming a dog trainer? Well, step number one, you gotta have a passion for it. You gotta absolutely love it. I'm telling you what, okay? I work ten to fourteen hours every single day. But I love it. I love doing this job. So first and foremost, okay, if you're considering being a dog trainer and you're not ready to put in 14 hours, uh, 14 uh, hour days for the next eight years, then this isn't probably for you. You gotta find something that you're passionate about and begin to pursue it. All right, so tip number two, one, you gotta love dog training. Two, you gotta love being poor. If you think that you're gonna be rich and make it big time, you're gonna be making you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in the beginning, it's not gonna work that way. You're gonna have to really be very humble when you start and hustle your face off to make it in this, in this business. There's a lot of dog trainers out there. 
a lot of dog trainers, there's a lot of competition. But the great thing about our field is there's also a ton of dogs. There's a ton of dogs and a ton of people to help. So one, be, have a passion for it. Two, live on a shoestring budget and, uh, you know, and don't complain about that. And then three, put out content, do videos like this, you know, be on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, on every platform that anybody spends any amount of time and put out content that's useful and give as much as you can possibly give. But then the other thing that you can do is you can begin to hone your craft by training your own dogs and reading every dog training book that you can read. And so really, those are my tips. If you wanna be a professional dog trainer, have passion, have hustle, be poor, and then put out content like it's nobody's business, and that's how you can make it. Um, I'm very, you know, very, very blessed and very fortunate to get to do what I do. Um, the quality of my life in the past eight years has, very, has improved immensely, and I'm so thankful for that. But I gotta continue to put in the hard work to continue to do that. You know, we have over 80 five-star reviews on Google, um, and I'm not gonna rest on that. You know, we're really gonna put a commitment out there to train to the best of our ability every single day. I have a fantastic team that's behind me. Um, I like to invest into their lives as well. And so, yeah, you know, you really gotta have a passion for it, but I love being a dog trainer. And, and who, uh, any of you guys that are watching this, if you don't absolutely love what you're doing, go do that. Except for my employees, you guys stay here with me, okay? I, I can't lose y'all, we, we need you guys. All right, so what's next, okay? What's next, on, what's next on the list? Okay, so next on the list is what is your favorite breed to train? So my absolutely favorite breed to train is the German Shepherd Dog. You know, I just love these guys, man. They are, they're intelligent. They have wonderful temperaments. Um, they're incredibly versatile. They're very, very powerful. And boy, are they high maintenance dogs, okay? At least mine, okay? You know, Fritz, he's getting a little bit older. He's here by my side right now. Um, he's, uh, he's pretty easy to, to get along with. Uh, but my younger dog, Gabriela, Gabby, Oh uh, boy, is she something else, man. If you, you just, you know, you just have to be practicing and training and, and they need you. The, 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 German, the German Shepherd really, really needs an owner that is all over it. So between my business and my personal life and training with my dogs, it takes up all of my time. But they're really fantastic dogs. Love the breed so much, okay? But one thing that I will mention is I'm not all that pleased that it's the number two breed. I think they're overbred. I really do. I think that they're a little, that the, when you look at the scope of the breed, that they're a little bit watered down. No, they're not a little bit watered down. They're a lot watered down. There's so many German Shepherds that are being bred that don't have any business being bred, okay? And really, you know, I think that a German Shepherd is a very unique dog um, and that we should, we should treasure the breed. But I absolutely love working with them. They have a lot of intelligence, a lot of power, and uh, it's just a great family dog when, uh, when you put the work into that dog. It's just like anything else. If you, want, if you want your dog to be great, then you gotta put a lot of work into it. So hopefully that is helpful for you guys. Okay, so um, all right, this was a pretty interesting question. I've never really gotten this one, and I see Charles. Hey, Charles, thanks so much for joining in. And hey, man, if you wanna chime in on this next question, um, I would really appreciate it. So if you have any context to add. So the question is, how do Dobermans and Wheaton Terriers compare? Boy, could these two breeds be any different? Let me just give you a couple of tips on Dobermans and a uh, Wheaton Terrier. So one, I absolutely love the Doberman. It's a great dog. And the one thing that I see about them is they really are Velcro dogs. And what I mean by that is when you live with these dogs, they so want to be in your personal space and be, you know, touching you and just being right there where you are, more so than my German Shepherds. You know, my German Shepherds like to have a little bit of space. And I know there's Dobermans like that too, but man, when I see the way that Dobermans interact with their, uh, with their families, um, they really like to be there. They're a very goofy breed, if you don't know that, but they're also very powerful. So how does that compare to a Wheaton Terrier? Well, a Doberman obviously is a very la is a, is a large dog, where the Wheaton Terrier, well, not so big, but it's a terrier. 
And the one thing that I tell everybody about terriers is that the terrier is really a dog that's all about chasing other dogs. So this is a dog that you're gonna have a little bit of struggle in your leash walking. This is a dog that if it's loose and it sees uh, squirrels or deer or things like that, this is gonna be a dog that's really gonna to wanna to chase after them, okay? Uh, they are affectionate dogs, okay, but they are more independent-minded than a Doberman would be. All right, so those are my two takes on Dobermans and Wheaton Terriers. All right, how are we doing, guys? Hey, we've been going for 40 minutes. I've got some nice lemonade here. Going to take a sip of that. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining in tonight. Really appreciate all you guys. If, I, if anybody has any questions or anything that I can do to bring some value, hey, would love to take your questions right now. All right, so what is next? Okay, so I've got, all right, so some quick, uh, quick tips. Here we go. Quick, quick tips, I can't talk, for coming when called. So quick tip number one is have a hungry dog. You absolutely want to have a very hungry dog when you first start training coming when called. If you decide to train outside with your dog, then another quick tip that I want to give you is make sure that you have a long leash for if your dog doesn't respond, that you can use your long leash to reel your dog back in. And then tip number three for coming when called is a lot of repetition. Try to put practice in every single day, making the association that your dog's name means to turn around and come back. All right. So how do you help a dog overcome fear? Okay, this is a bigger picture, but it's all in the lifestyle, okay? Now, some dogs genetically are pretty weak, okay? They're gonna be weak and they're gonna be more prone to fearful states of mind, okay? But the big thing is, is the lifestyle that you're living with the dog. The number one way that I feel that you can actually help a dog overcome fear is by teaching them a skill like stay and show them how rewarding it can be to do that, okay? But also setting up effective boundaries. What I think that happens with fear is that a dog, when, when anybody senses fear, when any kind of creature, emotional creature senses fear, then they begin, they begin to run away. And then when they get far enough from the fearful thing, they can relax and, and do that. But one of the things that we wanna show them is where do we want you to run to and even in the face of fear that, hey, I'm right here with you, I'm right by your side, and that you can rest in my power to understand that it's going to be safe. And then once they actually begin to relax, to make associations that this thing that's causing you fear and anxiety, that if you actually relax, will show you that it's actually not that bad of a thing, and that it can actually begin to, you can get rewarded in its presence. Now, one thing I'll talk about fearful dogs when you're trying to use food or treats for them is that it doesn't work. Any of us can actually relate to this. If you've ever been nervous or really adrenalized, you don't eat particularly well in those situations. So when you have a fearful dog and you're actually trying to offer them food, it doesn't really work the way that it would if they were in a calmer state of mind or if they were focused on obtaining the food. The one tool that actually does work particularly well for calming a dog is a leash because the leash applies pressure and pressure does have a bigger calming effect than food does. So when you're overcoming fear, it's really about the lifestyle practicing with your dog, showing them, showing them how to earn reward, but more importantly, using your leash to help them to begin to become calm. All right, so I've got a few more topics. Thank you to everybody that's joining in tonight. Really appreciate you guys. All right, so how does being, uh, oh, okay. So how does being intact uh, affect your dogs coming when called? You know, it's interesting that I've seen this with Fritz and Gabby, when Fritz was still intact, if Fritz was in the backyard and let's say that Gabby was in season, if Fritz went over to where Gabby had just used uh, the restroom and he was sniffing that, it was very difficult to get my dog uh, to come back. One of the things that I like to do in my training is I like to actually train my dogs with my equipment on them when in season females are around so that way they can understand that you still have got to listen. So an intact dog definitely, definitely is gonna be affected um, by females that are in season. But 
I don't think that it's all that insurmountable to teach the dog that they still have to come, even though this very powerful scent is in the uh, is in the environment. Um, but one thing that I'll mention, okay, if you're considering if you're considering neutering your dog, neutering your dog prior to uh, I think about you know six to eight months will eliminate the, the secondary sex characteristics. But I never ever recommend neutering your dog at this age. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you my recommendation is if you're considering neutering your dog and trying to change this behavior is one, do more training and please, I would recommend not to neuter your dog or to have the conversation with your veterinarian until they're approximately two years of age. There is a little bit more to this issue that I can go into at a later time, but dogs that are intact and, and if they're very young, I don't believe that we should neuter them uh, we should neuter them all that early, that we should actually train them on, t teach them how to deal with the distraction of in-season females, as opposed to removing organs to deal with that. All right, so I do have one more, I do have one more thing on my list that I do wanna cover tonight, okay? And so the last thing is, or what are some of your favorite muzzle games? So a muzzle, you know, a lot of times in our society is kind of looked at as something that's actually a little bit scary. Um, and dogs that are wearing them that they should be avoided. Um, but a muzzle is a very, very powerful tool to really kind of keep your dog safe, especially if you know that, hey, if your dog is aggressive, you have a dog aggressive dog, but it's well trained, but if another dog was to come into your dog's personal space that your dog would probably try to defend itself. So muzzle is a really good way to defend your dog against other dogs that come in and other people that come in and invade your dog's space, especially without your permission. So one of the great ways to actually train your dog for muzzle is to get one of these enclosed muzzles, okay, and then begin to put bring food into the muzzle, have your dog stick its face in there, and when it does that, release the food and begin to pet your dog. As a matter of fact, this evening, I actually started a family on some muzzle training because the dog struggles a little bit at the vet, and we're trying to teach the dog how to overcome some of these anxiety at the vet. So we're gonna do some muzzle conditioning. What I don't recommend doing with the muzzle is never putting it on, getting into an emergency, slapping it on, and causing even more stress to your dog. I think everybody at some point should do a little bit of muzzle conditioning with their dog. I think that can be very useful. Well guys, I'm gonna give you all just a couple of moments uh, to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, if you don't have any questions, hey, why don't you start smashing that, that thumbs up? It means the world to me, but I appreciate every single one of y'all that's watched this. Hey, if you watch this after the fact, hey, thanks so much for watching this. If you have any questions that I can ever answer, would love to take those from you guys, but appreciate every single last one of you guys that have tuned in tonight. Well, guys, that's it for me. Have a wonderful night and uh, take care. We'll see y'all soon. Good night.